All right, welcome in, everybody. This is Sports and Money. I am Ben Parker. Thank you so much for joining us. We have just completed, uh, for those of you who didn't watch it, we have just completed a first-round mock draft, a rather extensive, uh, detailed uh, first-round mock draft for the NFL coming up here in just a couple of weeks. Uh, Simon and Jordan and Ronan, we all four of us took turns with several teams trying to uh, think through what we would do if we were the general managers of the teams, not necessarily trying to predict what NFL teams are going to do. Jordan had to go. Me and Simon and Ronan are going to discuss uh, the draft in general and our mock draft in particular. If you want to see that mock draft, we'll have that posted as well in case you happen to see this discussion first before the uh, uh, before the actual mock draft that we post as well. Uh, Simon, thank you for joining us. And Ronan, thank you for joining us. Simon, how you doing, man? There we go. Simon, can you hear me? Man? All right, sorry. Yeah, my, my AirPods died. I, I apologize. We had a rousing uh, mock draft just now where, uh, yeah, we were on for hours. Ben made Ronan cry. So my AirPods died. So I, I apologize. <laughs> uh, did I have a specific um, prompt to answer for you, Ben, or was it just general thoughts on how, how it went? It was just a, a generic, how are you doing? I, I will ask this. Oh. I'll, I'll start with Ronan. Well, I answered that with I'll... making fun of Ronan, so my bad. <laughs> um, I will ask this. By the way, for those of you who want to know what Ronan looks like, just go to my YouTube channel. Um, it's all over Sports and Money uh, NFL uh, GM. So uh, he does actually go out in public sometimes, right, Ronan? Yeah, yeah. And be sure to watch my stuff, too, so I can afford a uh, setup. Yes, absolutely. I understand. Listen, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to turn the camera and show you what's behind my camera. All right. It, it looks like a bomb has gone off in here. So, yeah, I totally understand. Um, Ronan just Ronan, hiding a Cliff with... Kingsbury draft setup. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Poker <That's it>, face. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, Ronan, I'll start with you, man. It, any surprises in our first round mock? I'll, I'll ask you two things. What was the name you wrote down halfway through the draft that you were surprised was still there? And then uh, aside from that, looking back on our whole mock draft here, uh, any surprises that stood out? Yeah, I was right there with Simon. Uh, Olave, I was really surprised that he hadn't been taken yet. Uh, a lot of people think that he could be number two. You know, some have the top, the top two receivers as the two Ohio State receivers. Right. Uh, as far as the whole mock draft, I was a little bit surprised that David Ojabo wasn't selected, but I also understand with his injury, he's not the most sexy pick to get. He won't be able to play right away. Personally, I considered to take him at uh, 27 with Tampa uh, whenever I took George Karlaftis, but I went ahead and took the uh, the guy who would be able to play next year, be able to have an impact year on Brady's, I believe, last year on his deal. It was set in stone. So you want to be able to have the guy uh, play Brady's last year, potentially. And interesting you say that, Roland. I love Ojabo. Matter of fact, I, I, my opinion is he might have as good a career as Aiden Hutchinson has. That's how much I like him with his speed mm -hmm. on the edge. But the one reason I didn't go for him was so many of the teams in the, in the late part of the draft are kind of in win-now mode, like you just mentioned with the Buccaneers. And I wasn't sure I wanted to wait a year or year and a half for Ojabo to kind of catch up with speed. So it, as I'm thinking through it as a general manager, it wasn't that I didn't love him. I really do. I, I just didn't want to pick him out uh, for a team that, that was ready to kind of compete for Super Bowl next year, you know? Precisely. And before the injury, I think he was worth a top 10 pick. And, you know, I, I think you could still justify taking him top 10, top 15, if you're willing to sit right. there and wait and bank on the long term. You know, a team like uh, the Jets could really benefit from a guy like Ojabo, yeah. you know, if they're willing to wait that long. My, my feeling is, Simon, I'm going to bounce this over to you for three different things, but you can pick up on whatever you want. My feeling is the same thing that happened tonight with the, with the mock draft to us is going to happen in the real draft. I think somebody in the second round, early second, is going to get a real steal there with Ojabo, a team that can actually afford to wait a season or two for him to kind of uh, – get back healthy and also be up to speed. Simon, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely considered him with a couple of those picks in the first round. Uh, I think the Steelers, honestly, if a lot of guys on their board aren't there, Ojabo could be a guy that 
they could say, hey, we're good. We'll we'll pick them up and we'll have our linebacker for next year. Um, I think the Titans could certainly do something, but they they're kind of in the hot seat. Um, and even at 32 with the Lions, like, you know, I talked about that's kind of the bonus pick when you get that last pick in the first round for a team that could certainly use more help at, at linebacker and, and edge rusher and, and just everything Ojabo does. It, it would not be a bad move by them to essentially get, you know, a, a first round pick at linebacker this year in Thibodeau. And then if you think about it, Ojabo is a first round pick next year, too. If You just let him rehab. Yeah, I agree. Simon, what do you think with there with the Lions pick with Desmond Ritter? I know you personally yeah. like Ritter out of a let, let's let's call it a questionable group of quarterbacks. And, and somebody may have a different opinion about one of them, but certainly as a group, they're question yeah. marks all over. But if you're the Lions, and, and for that matter, if you're Carolina sitting here at six, you you've been losing for a long time in the Lions case. You're kind of desperate in, in, in the Panthers case. Uh, I, I guess I asked this question, why not go ahead and take a stab at a quarterback um, and, and let, you, let you introduce your thinking there for it's number 32 for Desmond Ritter? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know for the Lions, uh, Jared Goff isn't the long-term answer, but we also know when it comes to their second overall pick, they're very, they're happy with Jared Goff. They, they were very vocal and very positive when it came to Goff last year both when they traded for him, then when the season started, then all through the year, they were like, no, no, he's our quarterback. I feel they're in the exact same position this year. I don't, it's going to, he's going to cost them a lot of money, whether he plays for them or not at this point. So there's no point in feeling the rush to move on. So with the second pick, don't worry about quarterback, but if at 32, there's a guy on your board that you really like, and that's what happened for me, um, then yeah, go ahead, see what happens. It feels a lot easier, doesn't it? After, and you already said this, but after you've got Kayvon Thibodeau with the number two pick, you feel like, okay, talent-wise, I've checked that box. Um, what, if, whether he pans out as a star or not, I've, checked, I've at least checked the talent box. I get a little more freedom to go after some, you know, somebody else that's telling the first round. It's, it's, it's kind of nice having that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, for all these teams with two picks, I mean, the Saints, the Eagles, um, the, the Jets, the Giants, you know, especially if you get your guy, your number one guy first. Um, then it's kind of, you know, the the wild card pick. And if you swing big and, and you miss, then at least you have that other pick you made to, to fall back on. Ronan, I, I want to ask you something. I, I, I don't remember who it was, but there was one player, maybe two, but I, I want you to talk through, as a general manager, you're sitting there, you know when your pick is coming and you know what one guy you just really want to have. And you're tempted to trade up, but you know it's going to be expensive. You know, nobody's just going to let you move on up for, for a cheap price. Right. So talk to me about that, Roland. If you're the general manager, you're like, Dad, Gumma, I really want this guy, but do I just sit here and wait for him to come? And, and how, much, how much can I be satisfied if somebody else grabs him before he gets to me? You know, I guess it all comes down to how much you value the player. Because, uh, like I said, I, I – I think you're referring to the uh, number 10 spot with Gardner whenever you right, took that him. Was it. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if the Jets really, for instance, if the Jets really like Gardner, uh, you can justify moving up two spots, a spot, whatever you think is necessary to get him. Because a position like corner, a position like edge, a position like tackle, you need a top guy. I, I guess you don't need because, you know, teams have proved that time and time again. But the starting foundation to success is having a key guy at some of those areas. And if you don't have one of those, like the Jets, where, you know, all you really have is Mekhi Becton as like a true foundation piece, I, I why not go up to the fifth pick, the seventh pick and get Gardner? That's where I am. As a, as a, me personally, and, and you guys can jump in on this, Simon, I'll probably hit you up next. As a general manager, I would be very conservative and very long range kind of a thinking, kind of a general manager. I know I would. But in the draft, if there's a guy I really, really, really like, um, I, I'm still very tempted to go ahead and trade up anyway, 
providing I don't have to give up half my roster or half my future to, to get that pick, you know? So like Ronan was saying, Simon, from uh, say moving up from, you know, 12 to 10 or moving up from 20 to 13, not going to be a, a crazy price tag, but uh, I, I'm tempted. Simon, what do you think about the, that perspective from a general manager? Yeah, it's all about what you can convince your owner of. You know, if, if you're an accomplished head coach or an accomplished GM, and you can look your entire team in the eyes between the coaching staff, any players that are in the room making helping make decisions, um, ownership and the rest of the front office and say, this is my guy, this is going to work. Then you go do it, you know, whatever it is. I mean, you're talking about moves that won't cost that much for the Steelers, for example, if they love Malik Willis, we just saw in our mock draft, there's a chance he goes six. So there's a chance you have to go to four or five to go get him. And going from 20 to four or five, that's going to cost a lot. But if Kevin Colbert looks at Art Rooney Jr. or Mike Tomlin does and says, it's worth it, let's go get him, then, you know, it's the right move. Now, whether you're going to be right or not, that's, you know, a whole different ball game. But in terms of process, if it's your guy, and like Ronan was saying, it's one of those key positions, you know, you're not going to do that for a center, right? If if you're, who'd you have? The Vikings love Linderbaum. Yeah. They're not going to look at their owner and say, we have to trade to the top 10 for him. No, don't do that. Right. But if this guy can be our franchise quarterback, you go get him no matter what. Yeah, and, and you know, for me personally, you know, you mentioned the Linderbaum pick. That's a reach right there by every mock that I've seen. Not so much because of Linderbaum's talent, but because there's a thinking in the NFL, you don't draft a center that high. And I can understand that thinking. My, my personal view, if I'm the Vikings, is I've already got two solid tackles that are very young, or one of them is already on his second contract. We just signed him. We need help on the interior. Uh, Kirk Cousins needs all the help he can get, whether I go grab a wide receiver or whether I get some an interior uh, interior lineman help. And, and me personally, I would never have signed Kirk Cousins to that contract again, but they just did. But if whether it's Cousins in 2022 or whether it's a young quarterback in 2024, Linderbaum, I think, is really going to solidify that offensive line uh, with, the, with those two tackles for the next five years probably. So uh, even though it's a stretch there, that's what I'm thinking. Um, Ronan, if I wanted to ask you about the quarterbacks, both of you about the quarterbacks, if if you're sitting there and, and Malik Willis is at number six for the Panthers, do you draft him there? Do you completely pass him up, understanding that, that they are fighting for their jobs there in Carolina? Ronan, what are you doing there at six? To be honest with you, the the biggest thing on Willis is how he might not be pro ready yet. You know, he's got a, a large ceiling, a high, high, high ceiling, but he might not be pro ready just yet. You know, he's got accuracy issues, what have you. Yep. So I've seen a lot of people think if they go quarterback, potentially pick it. Uh, some right. people think he's a little bit more pro ready. I think you hit it right on the head rule is grasping. He's got to make a a big push right here uh, if he wants to keep his job. And I don't know if Willis is that guy because I mean, maybe he is because if he shows flashes, you can say, well, hold on, hold on. Just give me a couple more years. And you you saw what he can do. No, just let me build this team around him. So maybe he is the right selection there but i think from a win now perspective that's a little bit more of a roll of the dice it, it there's no doubt I, me and me and you have talked about this a little bit me and simon have talked about it more but if you're desperate you you kind of do things that you know may not pay off five years from now but you're just trying to save your job and if you can tell the owner or the general manager we're progressing he's young the quarterback's young give us another season or two it might save your job uh uh, the, the human part of this is, is very real. I think it shows itself up a lot in both the draft and free agency. Simon, um, I want to talk to both of you all about the trades. We didn't do any trades. <laughs> and you you and me and me and Ronan, and I assume you and Ronan, uh, talked about a lot of trades this past week. And what I kept running into was they're not easy to do. It's not easy to find somebody who has what you want who wants what you have and are also willing to come to a price. So we talked about a ton of trades. I know we did. 
and some big blockbuster trades. Ultimately, we didn't do any, do any of them. Um, but Simon, talk to him about that as a general manager. It's not, a, it's not easy to find a trade, is it? No, and the fact that, I mean, I knew, and I, I joked about this before we did it, where it was like, can I just yell out a trade offer like when someone's on the clock, right? Right. <laughs> but that's hard to do. This thing is moving quick. You're like looking at your yes. board. You're, you're thinking, you're trying to think three moves ahead. And then all of a sudden the guy's picking and it's like, well, uh, you right. know, it's over. And I don't know if the NFL is the same as the NBA, but like you'll see in the NBA draft, someone will get picked. And then it's almost like the trade negotiations happen after. Whereas the NFL feels like, yeah, everything's got to be predetermined or like, you know, the pick is traded before the dra- or before the pick even happens. Um, it's really about who's on your board, right? So like the example for you right. and me before the draft started was I was – picking for the Lions at two, you were picking for the Seahawks at nine. Uh, We were talking about some way to maybe trade down and swap assets, swap DK Metcalf, do something like that. And for me, it was, I need my, my guys on the board for the Lions were Thibodeau and Hamilton. And I needed enough to happen for me to feel like, okay, if I lose out on one of these two by going to nine, am I getting what I need equal to that? And, you know, Like I talked about during the draft receivers, just kind of tricky because there's always receivers in the draft, yada, yada. But it's about how many you count on your board and then how many spots you're going down. If I was the Lions and I was going down to four with the Jets, I'm a little more open and don't need quite as much because I feel in those four picks, I can still get Thibodeau or Hamilton. And that's, you know, what would have happened. Ronan, how difficult was it to make trades? We didn't do any, do any. I know you were interested. Um, How hard was it? You know, it's just like Simon said, it's tough to find someone who's wanting what you have and willing to give up what you want, you know? So uh, for the Jets, I I was wanting to find some kind of wide receiver and potentially trade down. And uh, of course, you want to move Brandon Cooks and uh, he just signs a two-year extension. So there goes those plans, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Maybe not, I guess, but. You know, I think like a DK Metcalf deal would be uh, on the table, you know, because the Jets, for instance, I keep referring to the Jets, but uh, they were my top two picks. They yeah, they were in on Tyreek Hill and uh, you know, whiffed, and he went to a division rival. So this almost makes it seem like they're going to be more inclined to, but it's just tough to determine what – what would be worth giving up and what the Seahawks would potentially agree to because, you know, you can't get a first from Seattle uh, this year. I don't know. And that's the interesting spot to draft in too. Right. And we kind of said it when we were in there and that's, this is what Ronan's talking about getting into that eight, nine, because right now Seattle and, and Atlanta are the two, I would say, most confusing teams in the league where it's you just have no idea what they're looking for. And those are usually the teams to try and trade with because they're just kind of like, hey, we'll roll with whatever. So, I, Ronan, I want to know from you, um, we both talked about Kyle Hamilton the other day. And I said during the draft, you know, when Jordan took him at five, I was ready to jump up ahead of you with Washington. You were picking at 10 with the Jets. I had Washington at 11. I was ready to jump ahead of you if he kept falling. And I think he's a guy that if he does continue to fall, we'll see someone trade up for him. Um, were, were you thinking about trying to make a move up as he was slipping and then he was at five? And then after he answers, Ben, would you have traded back with one of those two picks knowing Hamilton was on the board? You know, I was thinking about it. I, I was thinking more Gardner, uh, okay. to be honest with you, because, you know, corner is a little bit more of a premier position. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Jets safety, they got Jordan Whitehead and uh, they've got, I believe, Ashton Davis on the other side. Mm-hmm. You know, so you could upgrade, you know, I think Kyle Hamilton is an upgrade over Ashton Davis. But uh, I, I was primarily thinking Sauce Gardner the entire way. And uh, that didn't pan out how I would have hoped. But... Yeah, I, I guess to answer your question, he was on my mind uh, if Gardner was taken, but 
then would you have traded either of those two picks? Uh, would you have traded back from eight or nine with Hamilton on the board if you got an offer? I still would have. And, and the reason is both of those teams are so far away from winning anything. I'm looking two and three years down the road. And while I love Hamilton, I personally have him as one of the top five guys in the draft. Love him. Love his center field ball hawking ability. I just, he's one player. And so if I can get, you know, in my head, two solid starters, or maybe even two starters and a, and a, a bench, and not a bench player, two, two starters and a rotational player, I, I'm going to trade on back because um, I'm looking two or three years down the road. And I don't think Hamilton by himself can make the difference. It's one reason I get a little disappointed seeing players this good go to franchises this bad because <laughs> as good as they are, they just can't make a difference on a roster that's that bad. It's kind of frustrating. So, yes, to answer your question, and that's why I was starting to, even though Hamilton wasn't on the board, Gardner was. I've got Gardner probably a step ahead of Hamilton. Um, here again, this is where need starts to in- interfere for me. The Falcons, their biggest need, obviously, is wide receiver. But I think Gardner is a significant better player than London myself. I, I could be wrong. Um, but there I am grabbing for need with, with Drake London because I'm thinking wide receiver, wide receiver. Looking back, i probably take Gardner. But to answer your question, whether it's Hamilton or Gardner here, available eight or nine, yeah, I'll trade on back because I, I'm looking to build a good, solid roster. Yeah. So, um, Simon, you mentioned the quarterbacks. Um, Simon, I, how many teams are already positioning themselves? And I know, I know you already – you're heavy into this, and, and I'll kick it over to Ronan after that. How many teams are already positioning themselves for 2023 and eyeballing one of those quarterbacks that might be in the 23 draft? Well, let's find where, where you and I were chatting on Twitter the other day, right? Because that's, right. that's where it starts. Um, and Fielding there, Yates really started this, right? With his, yep. uh, yeah, his yep. article. This this tweet came from Field Yates. He listed the four or five teams that are um, have multiple picks in the first round next year already. So in next year's draft, uh, there are five teams. So there's the Miami Dolphins, there's the Philadelphia Eagles, there's the Detroit Lions the Seattle Seahawks, and the Houston Texans. Those five teams already have two first-round picks in next year's draft. Um, The Dolphins, the Eagles, and the Texans all have quarterbacks on rookie deals who you would think by the end of next year you'll know if you want to give them a second contract. Tua is going to be in his third year. Jalen Hurts is going to be in his third year. Davis Mills will be in his second year, but he he got more playing time his rookie year than those other two. Uh, Detroit, who I mentioned, I'm sure they'll be ready to move from Jared Goff next year or after next year. And then the Seahawks, they just, I I don't know who their quarterback is. Um, But all five of those teams are putting themselves squarely in position to, to get a guy next year. And that's kind of the boat I've been on this whole draft season, because these, these five quarterbacks who are going to go day one, day two here, we haven't, we didn't start talking about any of them as NFL quarterbacks until Kenny Pickett did his fake slide in the, in the bowl game. Um, the quarterbacks next year we've been talking about since last season. I'm not a big college football head. And I listen to in the flat podcast to get my, my info. Cause I don't know anything, but, uh, Bryce Young and CJ Stroud were names I knew last year. All right. They're not even draft eligible till next year. These five guys, I didn't know until, you know, the end of the college football season this year. So that's where I was thinking that I wanted the Steelers to be. Um, and it looks like there's already an arms race getting ready to trade up for one of those guys next year. Ronan, let me ask you this. Same, same uh, topic, but slightly different uh, tilt on it. If you're one of those five teams, say the Texans, Dolphins, Eagles, uh, uh, Seahawks, and I forget the other one. But if, if you're one of those five teams and you know you're going to be bad this year no matter what, like, you know, you could add a Tyreek Hill or you could add a fill-in-the-blank, and unless you add Tom Brady, you know you're going to be bad. Um how tempted are you to just start gearing up for quarterback next year? Let's assume they're both good. Let's assume they're both, you know, reasonably franchise guys without getting into that bait. But how, along with the idea that there's a lot of other people going to be trying to trade for these guys too, it may cost me 
both my arms and both my legs to get one of these guys. Ronan, where do you sit on that as a general manager trying to look ahead a year, um, balancing those two things out? You know, morally, you never want to tank, but uh, right. this would be the season to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> because like you said, it would cost an arm and a leg. And uh, it, especially you only named, you know, five teams. I think there's a couple more that will be looking towards okay. next, you know, Saints, uh, Panthers, who knows? So yep. uh, for those teams that don't have two first round picks, I think the pressure is really on them, you know, because uh, those teams with the two firsts will be able to, you know, send a little bit of a nicer offer over than the uh, than the ones who only have the one and uh, will have to give up some some sort of asset or, you know, the mortgage their whole future to bank it all on the young prospect. It's the same dilemma that Washington faced with RG3 years and years ago when they made that massive trade, uh, which, you know, RG3 turned out not to be really a franchise guy necessarily anyway, even before the injuries. He, a good player, but maybe not going to carry a franchise, but they had to give up everything to get him. Um, they didn't have as much talent around him as they really wanted, and he didn't get the support he might have needed uh, in order to get that chance to be the franchise guy. So um, same thing there. I, I think that you're running up against them. Um, it's not easy to do that. I, before I get into something I wanted to point out in the draft, um, Ronan, what else in the first round stood out to you as we did our mock draft? Um, as you went through it, the emotion you felt, or looking back on it, hindsight 2020, what else jumps out at you off, off the board right now? You know, one name that really stood out to me and uh, it kind of, I guess, took me by surprise that he fell that far. Maybe it wasn't really fall, but N'Kobe Dean, uh, I think he could. Yeah, I think he could justify taking him in the teens. Truthfully, right. uh, he showed that he could be a franchise inside linebacker for a you know team, and it's hard to find one these days. I agree, Simon. Uh, hindsight twenty twenty. What jumps out at you, or what was the emotion? What was an emotion you felt as we went through that first round? going to be a bit of a homer here and when, when I came to the Steelers pick it was really hard for me to not do what I what I think they're going to end up doing or at least something that was more in the realm of possibility um, I don't know how many quarterbacks they'll have a first round grade on I do think they'll end up staying at 20 and just seeing who's there but Andrew Booth Jr. Um, they were everybody was at his pro day they go to Clemson every year um, they have such a hard time drafting good cornerbacks. And the fact that he was in the lap there at 20, I think would be really hard for them to pass up, especially if one or two quarterbacks are off the board. And then it just gets even worse that he fell to Cincinnati. Uh, so Ronan, that was a great pick <laughs> by you because the last time they tried to draft a corner in the first round was Artie Burns. And I think that was 2013. And that wow. was the year William Jackson was their top rated corner. They wanted him. And he goes to Cincinnati like two picks earlier. So they just settled for Artie Burns. And uh, we know how that went with those two guys. So, um, yeah, tough, tough go. I think that was the emotional thing. I think the thing I found most interesting, like intellectually almost, was your pick, Ben, with Arizona, Devin Lloyd at linebacker. This is the equivalent yep. of the NBA now, just saying, let's get four guys who are six foot eight with long arms and can shoot threes. And we'll just mess with people, right? And it's awesome. It's so fun to see because they can all do kind of the same thing and feed off of each other. And if you put a linebacker room together of Devin Lloyd, Zayvon Collins, and Isaiah Simmons, you're talking about three right. super modern linebackers who are yep. athletic. And like you said, Lloyd isn't that big, but Simmons and Zayvon are. So you've got two guys that can be vertical up and downhill, as well as sideline to sideline, and Devin Lloyd, who can be sideline to sideline and cover guy. And that would, that would be a really fun linebacker group to see. It's a different way to think. And, and honestly, that's just kind of where Lloyd fell to. I like Lloyd even earlier in the draft, personally, mm -hmm. but the way the draft breaks down, I didn't really catch the spot I wanted to grab him at from the teams I had. And I, obviously, you guys are the same way. Um, Ronan, back to you. Um, I. 
I know you liked, uh, I know you guys liked Booth there for 31, and I, I liked him at 31 as well. And the Kobe Dean could have gone higher, but I kind of sort of felt when I got to the Chiefs here, and I, I do the Chiefs pretty in depth, I didn't like what I had to pick from with the positions I needed. And even necessarily at the, at the Packers here, even though I like Dean, I didn't really like what I had to pick from for the positions I needed. And Lions, for, the, for Ritter aside, Lions have needs all over the place. So I guess not them. It kind of felt like, uh, you know, Booth notwithstanding, it kind of felt like right about here, that last tail of the first round, it feels like there's a drop off that I didn't expect to be there. Um, for you guys, where did that feeling start? Or do you guys feel like for the next 10 picks leading on to the second round that they're just as good as what's right here at, say, the lower 20s? Um, Ronan, what, what's your emotion there? You know, I think you get to pick – I don't know. I, honestly, I think you can still get a a, good, a really good guy in the second round. I almost, I almost wanted to say, you know, a specific number is where the drop-off point is, but I don't see it. Uh, honestly, I think you can get a – I'm trying to pull up who all is who all would still be available. I'll call out some names real quick that's on my board. Um, uh, Trey McBride, tight end. Christian Harris, linebacker. Brees Hall, running back. Kenneth Walker, running back. Daxton Hill and Lewis Sign. We both left, we left them yeah. off completely at safety. Boye Mafe at, at Edge, um, Kair Elam El- uh, and, and Roger McCreary. Uh, those are some of the names. Um, we didn't touch Matt Corral either. So, um, All names that have snuck into the back end of mock drafts. Right. Absolutely. Simon, emotionally, and, and again, without being super analytical, were you happy – in this area, did you feel like you could have kept on picking guys further down and been happy, or did it feel, feel like it even started earlier up for you? Like you said, it was about the position of need was where it kind of changed. Um, my big board that I had left, I had a lot of names that you had, and and they're all defensive backs. Kyrie Alam, um, Daxton Hill, Lewis Sign, Kyler Gordon, Roger McCreary, a lot of defensive backs. So if you're still kind of in that market, and that's why – Andrew Booth goes down all the way down to 31. It's a good defensive back group. And, right. you know, once you kind of hit, when it comes to defensive backs, it's either, you know, you get one of those top 10 guys usually, or they kind of fall off. And I, to see that happen in real time was super interesting because yeah. And like you said, taking the analytics out of it, because everything says go get Andrew Booth. But then your heart and your emotions kind of say, like, if I, I didn't get that top corner, I didn't get Sauce Gardner, I didn't get Derek Stingley, um, I didn't get Kyle Hamilton, that means he has to be a second-round pick. The real time factor, and, and again, uh, NFL teams have a little bit more time, and of course they get more preparation than we do. You know, we, we, we do the best we can for a couple of weeks here. But um, the real time factor is still a real thing. Uh, the clock is ticking, and – you know, your war room is split evenly on a couple of players. And, uh, you know, you're even debating as a franchise whether to be aggressive and trade up or just stick where you are. The real time factor, I think, kicks in real hard. That's what I love about the draft that we did uh, that we'll post here as well. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and, and then I will just kind of wrap it up with you guys' final thoughts. Wide receivers. In the early mocks that I was seeing, there were very few, if any, guys getting really mocked into the top ten. Now, the mocks I've been looking at the past couple of weeks are starting to show those wide receivers trickling on up, up into the top 10. And for us, that's exactly what happened in our top 10. I'm going grabbing London at number eight, uh, which we've seen the Falcons mock some wide receivers. But then, you know, the Jets are all over Garrett Wilson, who I think Ronan said he had maybe number one anyway. And, and then right here at, uh, at 13, I'm grabbing Jamison Williams because I like him. If there's a wide receiver you like, and there's several good ones, but if there's one you like, uh, you might ought to consider moving up, right? Because they can get gone in a hurry. Uh, Definitely, Simon. We're only yeah, I mean, them. you know, like we like we said during the draft, um, I think everybody, I think the market is kind of in that process of correcting when it comes to wide receiver. We saw this happen with running back a couple years ago, where. Eh, don't re-sign your running back. Just go get another one in the draft. Now that's quickly become just get an undrafted guy who's fast and, you know, the right size for you and you'll be fine. But with receiver, 
yeah, just go get one of these guys in the draft. When Justin Jefferson blew up week one of last year, essentially, that really kind of reminded every, or didn't remind, but just showed everybody you can get this in the draft. So just go do it. Uh, but that I think is going to lead to, we're going to start seeing receivers start going in the top 10 again, because, you know, teams like Kansas city want to trade Tyreek Hill, green Bay wants to trade Devonte Adams. Cause there's guys in the draft. Um, and yep. yeah, we're going to start seeing the like Braylon Edwards fourth overall to, to Cleveland again, right. Those days. Uh, so yeah, super interesting. Ronan, um, I, I, I'll just kind of reiterate what I was, what, what I think it was. Me personally, I'd rather not draft any one of these wide receivers in the top ten. I, I don't necessarily think they're as good as some of the other guys we're looking at. But if I'm a team who needs a wide receiver, they're going to get gone quick once they start going. So, Ronan, what do you do? How do you feel? Yeah, they're like you said, they're going to get gone quick, and we've seen all around the league how important the wide receiver position is. You know, and if you like a guy, you got to pull the trigger on him. Uh, me personally, uh, I really considered taking Burks there at 14 uh, with the Ravens. Uh, I think, you know, you hear his comparisons to Debo Samuel. And uh, I think if you added a Debo Samuel into an offense with Lamar Jackson, sorry, I mean, I know this is just absolute hell for you. But if you threw like a Debo Sam- Samuel esque player back there with, uh, Lamar on some option type plays some you know like you were referencing uh the bubble screens all that kind of stuff you, you can get really creative with it uh, meanwhile you know having Marquise Brown over the top you know Rashad Bateman doing whatever uh but yeah I, I think if you like a guy you got to pull the trigger on him because especially if your quarterback does If your quarterback is lobbying for one of these young guys, you got to pull the trigger, right? It it was interesting to be with wide receiver, and I totally agree. Uh, Some some people like the Drake Londons and the uh, uh, sorry the Traylon Burks because they are the big, the physical. A lot of other people are like, no, 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 give me the Alave, give me the Wilson, give me those speedy cats. Um, Maybe they're not my number one, but as my number two, I can do all kinds of things with them. And even still, some other people. A lot of people still have Jamison Williams as the top overall guy, you know, the most well-rounded guy. A lot of different opinions here. Good group. Who's the leader? I don't know. But, again, if you like one, you better grab one. Uh, Ronan, I'll kick it to you for final thoughts. Um, I, I got a specific question, then you can just add in your, your any th- final thoughts you have. What was the one pick that you were like, yes, I was hoping that would happen? It kind of sort of just fell in my lap like I thought it might. And, boom, I love that. This This just – this was my perfect pick. What was that for you? And then your final thoughts on the draft tonight. You know, I'm going to have to go with that 31 pick with the Andrew Booth Jr. Uh, I really thought he was going to get taken. Uh, I was kind of preparing to go for uh, kind of, I guess, some of the corners below him, like the McCreary, the uh, Elaine, uh, someone like that. But yeah, he landed right on my lap, 31. Any more thoughts on the draft, Ronan? I'm happy with it. Uh, I think as far as uh, my selections, uh, I think uh, hopefully I, I, I tended to the team's needs. Uh, I th- Overall, from all of us, I think we did. I, I really enjoyed everybody's opinions, different perspectives. Uh, whenever you hit me or whenever you hit us with the uh, Cardinals pick of uh, Lloyd, I was like, really? And then you, Simon kind of was sitting there selling me on it, uh, you know, talking about how that would that would be an insane trio throwing sideline to sideline vertical you could do a lot with them guys i don't know if you're still talking or not can you guys hear me at this point yeah Yeah, you're good okay for some reason when my ipods kicked off i can't hear you guys hardly at all barely so what i'll do is um simon i'm gonna I'll, i'll go ahead and do my little closing and then simon i'll let you close this out um and then I'll try to shut it down. Um, maybe send me a message or something. Let me know you're done talking. I'll try to listen. Um, everybody, thank you so much for watching. The, the, this draft was a lot of fun. The real-time aspect was a lot of fun. Ronan, thank you so much. Simon, thank you so much. Jordan, had the part. I really appreciate it. Jordan, thank you so much. Simon, um, I'll let you close it out, uh, and then I'll try to just kind of shut it down at some point. Um, Simon, um, what was your favorite thing that you got? What was the intersection? What worked out perfect for you? 
And um, then Simon, I'll let you close it out. Thank you, man. Yeah. So uh, I was very happy with my Philly picks, but having multiple picks and with for what they needed, I knew I would get what I needed. Um, my favorite pick for sure was Washington getting Charles Cross. Uh, this team needs offensive line help. They've done so many bad things with the offensive line. They wasted good offensive lines that they had, you know, five, six years ago. But then, you know, Charles Cross, who I think is the best pass protector in this in this draft, kind of just fell into my lap at 11. And I think that was the time where we were talking trades. And, you know, there was there was a good 10 minutes between picks. And I was at the podium the whole time ready to go for Charles Cross. So, uh, yeah, very, very excited about that one for sure. And then overall thoughts on the draft. Yeah, I think it went well. Um, the, the no trades is going to be the thing that we see bite us in the butt the most, I think, when it comes down to real draft day. There will be one or two. A couple more quarterbacks are probably going to get taken either a little bit earlier or just at some point. Um, so, yeah, we'll we'll just kind of see what happens. But, yeah, fun overall. A lot of fun to, to hear from everybody and get with everybody like this. So appreciate Ben putting it together. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much, Simon. Ron, appreciate it. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Ben.